It's a special day today. After all, how often do you get the chance to stand inside India's most fortified naval base and speak about its latest, most potent, most powerful battleship, which has just joined the fleet and will serve India's interests for the next three days. And I welcome you to the special broadcast from inside the naval dockyard in Mumbai. In September 2009, this giant, then merely a four-year-old piece of steel was christened as Kochi and was allowed to, for the first time, leave the yard and literally test waters. Today, full six years later, she is a potent destroyer. Ready to take on the task of upholding India's interests at sea. Just commissioned into the fleet formally, INS Kochi, with the credo of tough tasker, has many feathers in her hat. It isn't very often that a country builds its biggest battleship. In the absence of a completed aircraft carrier ship, this destroyer is the one. Let's get a feel of the ship. Let's go inside, sense her capabilities, and even if so, temporary deficiencies. In this almost compartment to compartment effort, we came across several islands of excellence, be it the Made in India design, her build, which allows a stealthy presence undetected fully by enemy radars, the systems on board or her weapons areas where India traditionally has not had much to speak of. To begin, let's understand first how this enormous piece of metal is operated. The first step in doing so will be to note that a ship actually functions like a large corporation. Men from different streams, be it aviation, electrical, gunnery, medicine and the like, lead their teams and all these team heads put their weight behind the ship's CEO, who the Navy likes to call the ship's commanding officer. This model also ensures that in case even a nut on the ship is not functioning the way it should, the recourse is very much available on board and at all times. We take our first lessons from those men who quite literally qualify to be called as the movers and shakers of INS Kochi. Ship is propelled by four powerful gas turbines, uh, which can propel the ship up more than 30 knots. Uh, these gas turbines are uh, similar to ones which are fitted on the Delhi class, but the uh, control system is much advanced and highly automated, so that the fault finding and rectification of fault is at faster rate. The ship generates about 400 megawatt <coughs> or about 6000 horsepower of energy which is distributed to various consumers on board be it the electrical domestic supplies or the weapons and sensors. All the consumers we know a priori here and what is their demands and sitting here we have the bird's eye view of the systems how much they are switched on or switched off and what is the total requirement on the generators to generate. That having been done, we move to the most critical part, her arsenal, the precise payload she will pound the enemy and defend herself with. The Indo-Russian long-range surface-to-surface BrahMos missile, which can strike surface targets 300 kilometers away. The Indo-Israeli Barak-8 missile, which will protect the ship by destroying incoming aerial threats anywhere between 70 kilometers and 500 meters. We then come to the torpedo tubes, which can hit submarines, the rocket launchers, which can decimate smaller targets, and finally to the super rapid gun mount right in the front portion of the ship and her side weapon, the AK-630 gun set, both of which together can form a sheet of steel with the extremely high rate of firing. All of this is then backed up by one of its kind MF Star multi-function active phased array radar which can track hundreds of targets and even advise the commander on which one to hit and with what. And finally, if the MF Star does its job above the surface, the next generation bow mounted sonar does the same below the surface. Said to be an extremely agile piece of equipment, what adds to its worth is that it is fully made in India. While it is one thing for the Navy to order all that it wants for its pet project, it is completely the other to fit it all into an already tight, confined space without losing value and that job falls on the shoulder of the shipbuilder. It's a very complex job. 
both in terms of the specialization of different components and then writing software for all these things. This is at the level of, uh, say, uh, uh, machinery control. Coming to the weapon control, it's an even more difficult uh, job for, for the shipbuilder and the Navy. So despite the innumerable odds, the INS Kochi has got all that the Navy could have wanted, at least on paper. The Navy insists that the ship has alternatives to what is temporarily missing from its arsenal and that she will come around to sport almost everything that has been promised sooner than later. However, these deficiencies for now render this otherwise powerful asset defenseless or powerless at least in the face of these adversities, something which does take the sheen howsoever little off its surface. This ship is capable of uh, any uh, role any mission, satellites, the shipborne surveillance, the aircraft borne surveillance, the UAVs. In fact, all these sensors are networked with each other so as to produce something called the common operational picture. It's like all of you sitting on board your specialized assets but still in one big theater where a common movie is being played out for all of you, no matter at what distance and what depth. That's right. I can only say this uh, in summary that we can give a very bloody nose to any adversary who challenges us. So much of automation and sophistication. Hardly a surprise that the ship is functional thanks to networks and systems, which also means that for an enemy to disable this ship, there can be no better target than these very systems. Cyber warfare, after all, is a designated frontier just like land, air, sea and space are. And given the cutting edge on display in the form of this formidable vessel, many are too keen to know more. There are guns, there are missiles, radars, sensors to ensure that no physical threat can be allowed to disrupt the operations of the ship. However, one very intriguing factor is the fact that everything on board is in the form of a system, a data network of sorts, which means that a lot of your systems are online and thus susceptible to attacks emerging from the cyber domain. What is not visible anywhere on the ship is the entire hardening of this ship's software, this infrastructure to ensure that none of these cyber attacks, these virtual threats are allowed to penetrate any further. In fact, not a single computer out here is connected to the World Wide Web. What they are connected to is an internal system. You think that after having achieved all of this, does there remain anything more? Of course, the man behind the machine. The job at sea might be demanding and those putting in the effort might be so much more responsive, but who doesn't need a hot meal followed by a good night's sleep? The largest warship constructed by India isn't only about weapons, surveillance and defending your interests. It's also about ensuring that a crew of about 400 people, personnel on board are fed three times a day, 365 days. These are the fryers that you see, different ovens which are available out here. And this is the second compartment. Remember, this is the area for the sailors to be, to be given their food in, prepared their food. Giant freezers that you can see, deep freezer is available out here. The temperature is quite chilled and it has to be that way for obvious reasons. This is the giant automatic dosa and roti maker which is available. It's quite a joy to see it actually in operation. This is the cake maker and as you see the big boys out there. These are the sizes that are there on display to tell you just what it takes to keep 400 mouths fed. Now of course where we are is a home away from home. These are the areas where the sailors come and rest. A single bunk bed is what a sailor gets and if you can just see from here on it's a very very well designed comfortable bedding that is available to a sailor. Little doubt that the Navy is flushing with the arrival of Kochi. In terms of its presence, it packs a punch. Could it have been better armed and deliveries of critical systems ensured on time? Obviously, yes. However, for a country which has been unable to shirk off the tag of being the world's largest arms importer, this effort is an impressive one and will surely go a long way in ensuring that the economy and the political interests of the country is well defended.
that was about the destroyer warship Kochi. The Navy, however, is far too significant a tool to be studied through the prism of a single ship, no matter how big or powerful she may be. And that's the reason why we now need to zoom out and see the canvas over which the Indian Navy is to leave an indelible presence. This canvas, which is as wide as the Strait of Hormuz in the west to the Strait of Malacca in the east, is also home to power play between different nations, natural disasters, terrorism and, ironically, 90% of India's trade. Enabling the exploitation of the vast blue waters and ensuring denial of the same to those with inimical interests constitutes the very core of what the Navy is and does. Securing a 7,517-kilometer long coastline across nine states and over 330 island territories, guaranteeing the security of economic interests which include 12 major and 187 minor ports where from emerges 90% of the country's trade are only among a few of the tasks that the Navy performs on a daily basis with partner agencies. That is today. But how will tomorrow look is best understood when seen through the prism of the past. Though traditionally believed to be a land-obsessed, inward-looking political entity, India, through the pages of history, under different dispensations, colours and even forms, actually manages to look different. The sea was more often than not of interest to the powers that be, sometimes to import, sometimes to export commodities like trade, culture and the like. And to uphold the same, they patronized all forms of allied activities, be it shipbuilding, repair and of course, the profession of arms. Shipbuilding as an industry, shipbuilding as a tradition is part of our ancient heritage. Some historians have gone on to say that till the 17th century, the largest ship beyond a few thousand tons were built in the Indian waters along the Indian coast. There was a link between India and if I may say uh, to Rome in the Mediterranean, to as way down as to Southeast Asia like Bali, uh, all the way up to China, uh, even to East Africa. In this ever-evolving scenario, traditional roles like countering piracy and providing relief to those struck by disasters like cyclones, tsunamis remain only to compete with newer ones which include evacuating our diaspora from war-torn regions as seen in Lebanon, Libya and Yemen to tracking fishing boats which can be carriers of mass murderers. What is not excluded are tasks like energy extraction and deep sea mining. For a nation which wants to up its profile at the global high table and counts every sixth individual in the world as its own, nothing can be enough. We create a perception in the minds of the people in our neighborhood that India is a meaningful, relevant power. A typical day at sea for the Navy is not limited to just humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. It is not limited to military activity. It is not limited to diplomatic force. It is not limited to constabulary function. It is always all of the above. Towards these goals, the Indian Navy has envisaged itself as a 150-ship Navy to be in place by 2027. At present, including the just commissioned INS Kochi, the strength stands at 138. In addition, 48 ships have been ordered and are at different stages of construction within India, a measure of indigenization the Navy has sought and achieved. Needless to say, as time passes, a number of these vessels will near the end of their operational life and thus will have to be retired. India also wants to play the good cop, ensuring stability, good order and freedom of navigation in the world's third largest ocean surface, the Indian Ocean region. As these markers point, 
it definitely is not a place devoid of the big players and high stakes. Finally, towards maintaining an all-round presence and a working relationship with the other important players the Navy exercises with a large number of nations apart from participating in several multilateral fora. Six decades after India's first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru said to be secure on land, we must be supreme at sea, glaring imperfections remain. In this segment, we take a long hard look at the areas in which the Navy, for a variety of reasons, continues to aid. Like in most things, the Navy of today has her roots in the past when she was almost an abandoned, undernourished fleet of sailing vessels till such time, war clouds gathered and led to what history recognizes as the Second World War. Actually read the history post-1950, when we see, for example, Vikrant coming into the Navy, when we see the cruisers coming into the Navy, the seeds were sown during the World War and these young planners were so clear that the vision and I would say it's like even when we look at the modern ships, Kolkata, Kochi, the seeds were in these young or what we call our predecessors, our founders of the Navy. Post-independence, the Navy's first major maritime offensive action came only in the fourth war that India fought in 1971, a fact of history which also reinforced the belief that land borders needed more attention. Notwithstanding all of this, the Navy continued to evolve, becoming the first in Asia to operate an aircraft carrier nearly 55 years to this date. In recent times, however, the albatross around the Navy's neck has thrived, be it the worst peacetime casualty in the form of explosion and sinking of its submarine, the INS Sindurakshak, within the harbour to the controversial exit of the previous Navy Chief Admiral D.K. Joshi. What has also led many to question the operating ethos has been the spate of accidents, some of them even fatal, that various naval ships, submarines and aerial assets have had, at least 24 within the last three years. For a Navy which takes pride in being a builder's Navy, shipbuilding, an area largely controlled by defence sector shipyards, is as much an area of pride as frustration. On its part, the government has declared these shipyards are to upgrade and expand. But as the INS Kochi, which took nearly a decade to build, tells us, there are some grave systemic issues which lie even beyond the government's reach. With this uh, improved uh infrastructure, improved methodology. I am committed to deliver the ship in the period of five and a half years to five years. And what is that, the that today? Is, today it is almost ten years. The whole uh, uh, circumstances are such yeah. that we are not able to reach the stage of freezing the design. Mm -hmm. And I will again come back to the point. The root cause is that we don't have uh, several key components of shipbuilding available indigenous. The problem goes even deeper according to those who've risen through the ranks and seen what the Navy likes to call its transition. There are a lot of underlying problems too, such as those associated with small volumes, those associated with our procurement processes, those associated with our need for looking at low-hanging fruits. The Navy uses it, Coast Guard uses it, the Army uses it, even the Air Force uses it. And we in India have not been able to get our act together to make something as simple as a 30 millimeter gun. If all of the words spoken were symptoms, then here comes the illness. Three critical areas stand out. Helicopters, which are the best submarine hunters and also perform a variety of vital tasks, are simply missing from the scene thanks to a contrived acquisition procedure amplified by governmental indifference. Subsurface warfighting, a sphere where adversaries like China and Pakistan have invested heavily, is nothing if not a concern. 
so criminal has been the neglect that it will take decades and multiple inductions before this fleet can grow. And finally, we come to manpower woes. If it is the man behind the machine who matters, the Navy actually has a lot to worry about. While it has made some progress in closing the gap pertaining to shortage of officers and men, the sheer inability of the top brass to ensure availability of accommodation for their men is causing some serious heartburn. And while few admit sailors and their families in a bit to get a roof over their heads, especially in cities like Mumbai, are even forced to share their residential quarters. Well, yes, uh, there are certain um, uh, capability challenges that we do have as a Navy and it is known nationwide. Uh, the Navy has never been uh, found lacking uh, as far as asking for resources is concerned. We are in a process of carrying out midlife upgrades of several of our uh, craft, including helicopters. So we will uh, bridge the gap wherever it is required and we hope that whatever inductions we are um, seeking will come through soon enough. So just where does that leave the Navy? Is it fair to say the ambition and promise have both been botched? Has the growth been stunted? We leave it to someone who in his last assignment had the task of shaping the Navy's future as the head of its premier training establishment, the Indian Naval Academy. The civilian segment of the MOD, the civilian segments of the MOD finance, and the uniformed segments of the Navy, if we don't position them on the same page, then no matter what we do, no matter how many Kochis and Chennai's and Visakhapatnams we create, we will not reach where we are manifestly destined to reach. In its first and foremost avatar as the Indian Marine, the Navy of today was nothing but a squadron of ships meant to protect the East India Company's shipping assets and activities. Over the course of time, when there was no war or a genuine appreciation of the threats that existed, many chose to question and even curtail its existence only to be corrected by the hand of time. Today, the company, the crown and their interests no longer remain valid, but those of the people of India do, and to those who are still in doubt, they are thriving by the minute. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.